He woke me up this morning and he gave me a brand new dawning. Hey, that's what the Lord he is done for me. Can I say it again? This morning, Lord, you gave me a brand new dawn. Hey, that's who won the glory. He's not to me. He opened. Because you're looking at me. mouthpiece for you. I pray that streams of heaven from heaven will come and flow today and bless your people and bless the speaker. Uh, I pray God that nothing in my life will be an inhibitor for the word of God to go forth. Don't allow nothing in my life to clog this word and the pipeline so that the word cannot flow. Then I pray the same for the hearer, God, that nothing will keep this word uh, from finding fertile soil in their lives as well. And may the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. We just want to be mindful of the fact that tomorrow morning at uh, 8 o'clock at the Golden Corral will come for our board meeting from 8 to 8.30 is uh, eating time. And then from 8.30 to around 10 or 10.30 is meeting time. Uh, so please make sure that if you are a member of the board that you come. We want to ask your prayers at 4 o'clock today until until 
The elders are going to be getting together for a special season of prayer. Um, from four until it will be midnight. Uh, but we're going to stay in the upper room until God gives us guidance and direction. I, I just ask that you pray for us during that time. Um, if you have not been coming to prayer meeting, you need to come to prayer meeting. need to come to prayer meeting. The book that we're using in prayer meeting is called Bring Back the Glory. It's an excellent book. Um, I picked up a few more from the book, book and Bible house at the ABC bookstore today, yesterday I think it was. If you don't have the book, you need to get the book. Uh, it will change your life. Uh, this is one of those days again. I don't, I don't even know if, if, if there's a sermon of late that I've preached that doesn't give me um, a certain weightiness of heart. And I've entitled the message for today, I Ain't Got Time to Shout. I Ain't Got Time out. Uh, an unusual title because we like to shout and we like to sing. Uh, but today I want to direct your attention uh, to something that's uh, on my heart. On Thursday night, We had the unfortunate task of uh, going over on Kirkland and Colonial to a candlelight vigil for the tragic shooting and passing of Gregory Whitbeck. His sister is a member of our church, Cynthia Whitbeck. Uh, he is an Adventist by profession and practice. And last Friday, not the last Friday, Friday before last, not last night, Friday before last, week ago last night, uh, yesterday, that Friday, he went to work, uh, text his daughter early in the morning before she went off to school, 6.30, 7 o'clock, told her how much he loved her and that daddy would call her after work. So he went to work, probably was in the office for a short period of time. My understanding is that he came out to give some paperwork to a colleague who was trying to pass the social works exam, Florida State Social Work exam. Gregory had just passed his not too long ago. And so he was excited after failing the test several times. He finally got it. And he was giving some material to a friend or a colleague whom he thought that material would help them pass the state exam as well. So when he went out to the car to deliver the material. A young lady and a young man, unfortunately people of color, uh, tried to rob him. And I presume that a scuffle ensued 
and uh, he ran away, and the young man shot him in the back, and the bullet went through his heart. Uh, he was administered CPR, but because of the severity uh, of the wound, uh, he passed away. So we attended the candlelight service, and uh, I was asked to say a few words, and uh, I listened carefully to the speeches of the attending dignitaries and pastors and bishops that were there. And I observed carefully the behavior and the body language of the crowd that has had assembled. Uh, the news said that the candlelight service was going to be that evening, and so there were strangers there, strangers in the sense that they did not know Greg Whitbeck. They simply wanted to come uh, and show their respect. Uh, they wanted to come, perhaps, and show their displeasure uh, in these kinds of often and unfortunate situations. But I noticed the behavior and the body language of the crowd as each person spoke. Uh, I could not help but notice the look on their faces. Uh, the crowd swelled uh, to quite a few people. Uh, before it was over, and as folk gave their condolences and their, his, his workmates uh, cried and told the crowd and the news uh, casters uh, how wonderful of a person he was, uh, that he was known as their gentle giant because he was around 6'4 in height, uh, and they said that he would do anything to help anybody. Uh, then they gave testimonies of all that he did that went way outside of the scope of his job. Uh, and the more they spoke, the angrier I became because I began to regret the fact that bad people were taking good people's lives. Uh, uh, during the speeches, there was a look of guarded optimism uh, as the pastors and the political representatives came and tried to boost the crowd and to let them know that things are going to be all right. But I watched their expression, and I noticed that they were guarded in their optimism, and there was some uncertainty in their response to our ability to, to, to inspire them. To let them know that, that it's going to be all right. I wondered after we disappeared uh, and after we dispersed whether the audience truly believed that we could make a difference and whether change was on the way. Uh, they didn't look like they really bought into what we were trying to say. Uh, they, they were reluctant. Uh, I, I, I don't claim to be a psychologist. I don't claim to be a psychiatrist. I don't even claimed to be an expert at reading body language, but 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 I noticed that the body language was 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 were drooping and there were hanging arms and and people just did not seem confident that there was a solution or that there is a solution to this madness that is going on. I left with the feeling that. The unfortunate reason for our gathering that night at that candlelight vigil uh, is going to happen again and again and again. And we are going to be on somebody's street corner. We're going to be in the front of somebody's business and in somebody's parking lot. And we're going to hold candles up again because of this madness, this craziness that's going on in our city and other cities. And when I got into the car, uh, I'm a reflector. I, 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 I think a lot. And I was hitting on the steering wheel like this, and my 
wife was sitting next to me, perhaps wondering what's going through my mind, because you know I'm always thinking. And then I, 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 I thought in my mind uh, of why the church exists today. Uh, why, why, why are we here? Uh, why, why do we exist? And could the church have made a difference in, 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 in Greg Whitback's life? And could we have made a difference in the life of the person who pulled the trigger and shot him in the back? I don't know if, I don't know if y'all, I don't know if you're with me. I, 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 you, you, I asked myself, uh, you know, what's the purpose of the church? And, and I guess I'm just wired like that. I, I'm wired like that. You know, when stuff happens, uh, I begin to, 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 to do a check down list of the what ifs and and, 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 and what about, and, and what haves, and, and why not? That's what I do. I just don't go to an affair and an event, and, and I see something tragic like that. When folks' eyes are swelling with tears, I just don't walk away and just say, we're going to pray for you. I do an inventory in my mind, and, and I ask, what if, and, 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 and should have, and, and, and why didn't, and, and how come? Is that normal? Am I wired differently? And so I was talking to my wife. And I said, sweetheart, I don't want to preach a sermon. You know, she hears more sermons than you all hear. But I said, I don't want to preach a sermon. I said, but I'm just wondering what the purpose of the church is. And, 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 and saints, I guess I'm stuck on what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verses 13 through 16 when he said that you are the salt of the earth. Uh, you, you know, and, 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 and if the salt loses its flavor, uh, how should it be seasoned? Uh, it is then good for nothing uh, but to be thrown out and trampled under the feet of men. He said, you are the light of the world. A city with, that is set on a hill cannot be hid, nor do they light a lamp and put it up under a basket but on a lampstand, and, and, and when it's placed on the lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine among men that they might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I'm stuck on that. Jesus did not say go out and try to be a light. He didn't say go out and try to be salt. Uh, he said that you are the salt of the earth. He said that you are the light of the world. And, 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 and the thing that keeps poking at me is, 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 is in spite of these modern technological advancements and, and engineering marvels, if you weren't born in the South when there was no electricity and no street lights, you don't understand what Jesus means when he says that you're the light of the world. See, see, we go home and flick our lights on, and, and we come outside of our homes, and there are street lights. Uh, everywhere we go, uh, this city is lit up. If you go to uh, Disney World and drive down I-4, you see all of the amusement parks with lights on. When you're born in the country, and you don't have any electricity. You know what light means, and you appreciate it. Uh, can I get a witness here today? You appreciate light. Before there was a refrigerator. And even when they were invented and you couldn't afford one. You know what salt means. You would put salt on your meat and smoke it out in the house. And that's the only way that you could preserve your food. Is because you put salt on it. You couldn't afford a refrigerator. So maybe when Jesus talks about being a light and being salt. Uh, our modern conveniences do not allow us and afford us to relate to him. He didn't say you trying to be a light. He didn't say you trying to be salt. He said that's what you are. And he made it clear and matter of factly. 
that your existence should make a difference and it ought to impact your community. That's what being a light means. That's what being salt means. That you ought to make a difference in the community that you live in, the place where you work, the home that you live in. You ought to make a difference because you're salt and because you are light. Oh, but some of us, Satan is blown out our light. We talk about this little light of mine, and we're still flicking it, trying to get it on. And when I think about light and salt, my mind this week, because I've been thinking about the Whitbeck family, went back to the book of Genesis, chapter 18 and 19, when the story is told about Lot living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I want you to listen to this now. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. But then when I went back and read this story about Lot, I went back to chapter 18 when, 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 when God spoke to Abraham and told Abraham that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sin. Well, Abraham, uh, having his nephew Lot living there, obviously was concerned about his nephew. And so he said, well, Lord, you're going to destroy them. I know it's very wicked over there, but, but listen, let me, let me bargain with you. If, if we find 50 righteous people uh, in the city, both Sodom and Gomorrah, twin cities, would you spare the city? And Jesus said, yes, indeed, I would. So, you know, you know Abraham said, certainly you're not going to treat the righteous the same way you treat the unrighteous. There's a difference between the two. And so, hey, if we find 50 righteous people, will you spare the city? God said, indeed, I will. And so obviously the Lord's response was, there ain't 50 there. And so Abraham brought it down to 45. And then obviously Jesus, God's response was, it ain't 45 righteous people there. And then he went down then in increments of 10. And he said, what about 40? What about 30, what about 20, what about 10? If you find 10 righteous people, will you spare this city? God says, indeed, I will. The problem is, is that there ain't 10 righteous people that live there. Boy, y'all ain't with me yet. Let me come down a couple more steps. Now, here's the problem that I have with this story. Is that Lot and his wife and his daughter and his son-in-laws and all of them lived in the city. And if you are light and salt, certainly there ought to be more people in the city saved. Okay, okay. Now, 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 now the book of Peter says that, 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 you know, Lot was a righteous man. That's what the scripture says, elders. That Lot was a righteous man. Here is the problem. How can you be a righteous man and live in Sodom and Gomorrah? And when God brings about an accountability, you can't find 10 people in the city where you live. Is it, is, is, are you feeling me? That lets me know that you can be righteous and still not light. You can be righteous and still not salt. Let me break it down to you. You can be righteous and go to church and pay your tithe and eat right and come to church every Sabbath. Righteous and still not be impacting anybody's life. Y'all need me to go over that again? The Bible called him a righteous man in the New Testament. And well, okay, now a lot of you're righteous. How come we can't find no more than 10? Not only that, let me go a little bit deeper. Not only did, not only, not only did his influence not impact anybody else in Sodom to the point of salvation, but his own family didn't even make it out. 
Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Help. Holy Ghost, if you help me preach this sermon, I'll preach it and I won't be long. His wife got out but didn't get in. She got out of Sodom but didn't make it into the kingdom as it relates to the fact that she turned back and became a pillar of salt. That's the wife of a righteous man. Let me make it up. Adventist. <laughs> and the wife didn't make it. She didn't want to go. And then the brother-in-laws, if you read chapter 19, the brother-in-laws thought that Lot was joking. Yeah. They thought he was joking when he said, hey, let's get out of the city because... God is going to destroy Sodom. They said, man, you, come on. What is that, an April Fool joke or something? Come on, Dad. Come on, Father-in-law, Father-in-law. No, no, no. They thought it was a joke. These are the same people who went to Lot's house to eat, who went to his Lot's house for worship, who went to Lot's house to pray, who walked around and went to church with Lot. And they never got out of Sodom. So I'm asking myself, when I was beating on the stern wheel and my wife was looking at me, I'm saying, what's the purpose of the church? We're righteous, but are we salt? We're righteous, but are we a light? We're righteous, but are we making a difference? We're light, we're, we're salt, but are we really impacting the community? I can't help but to think what impact did we have on Greg Wickbeck's life? Perhaps little to none. What impact did we have on the shooter's life? This is a young man who at five, almost five o'clock in the morning, that same morning, he went and robbed somebody at gunpoint who was on a bicycle. Then two hours later, he was on over in that same area and went to a Publix or some, some store and while he was there, he robbed a woman in the parking lot. And then he got to Greg Whitbeck. So who brings money to a dialysis center? Who brings money to a dialysis center? If you're a patient, you don't have anything on you. They tell you to dress casual and relax because you got to, you know, and, 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 and yet he, this man comes out to try to do a kind gesture. And because of a struggle and probably just a reaction, he ran and gets shot at. We're the salt. But are we impacting anybody? We're light. But is anybody following us down a dark path? And when I stood there, listen to me, saints. I'm looking at the crowd that had assembled. Some were invited. Some were for church members from Patmos. Some from our, we had good representation, praise the Lord. And then there were some strangers that were there. And I saw white and I saw black and I saw Hispanic. And I saw all different kinds of people who were there. And when I shook people's hands afterwards and spoke with them, they said, no, I don't know him. I just knew that there was a service here tonight. So I came. Another person said, no, I worked with him. Then another person. And then I noticed that somebody was Filipino, somebody was white, somebody was black. They were all colors. And I said, what in the world? These people have assembled at this candlelight visual out of the kindness of their heart because they're concerned about the violence. They're concerned about what's going on. And you know what I said to myself? This dawned on me. I may be crazy. I said, but you know what? If we were doing things pre rather than post, y'all ain't with me, before rather than after, the same kind of people, black, white, and whatever, who appealed, that this tragedy appealed to. If we're doing that kind of work, those are the kind of members we would have in our church. Y'all don't understand what I'm saying. I'm standing in front of the candles and all of that, and I'm looking at them saying, where did these people come from? All of these people knew Greg and found out, no, they don't. 
but they were simply there because they cared. But they left with a blank look on their face that nothing could be done about. And then I heard on the radio where the sheriff stand up, and he just sounded just an exas exasperation. And like there was no, he said, all right, look, crime is up, and violent crimes is up, and, and, and we got extra officers that are all around, the, you know, the streets, and we got people overtime and, and on extra duty, and, and yet crime is still rising. And, and if the crazy people wouldn't do crazy things, then, then we were, here's what he was saying. We can't do nothing about this. You can put more police officers on the streets if you want to. If you ain't light and salt, if you are not light and salt, to get the love of God in somebody's heart where they take that gun and put it down rather than stick it in somebody's face. When I thought about it, I said, you know what? I ain't got time to shout. What am I going to shout about? I'm not going to shout as long as a young lady, 25-year-old at the gas station, y'all ain't with me, who's sitting there trying to pump gas, gets shot, you know, blood everywhere, while her child is in the backseat of the car, and, 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 and some nitwit is arguing with somebody, and a stray bullet hits her, and now she's gone and left two or three children behind. I ain't got time to shout. I need to find these young men before they bring the gat out, before they bring the Glock out, before they bring the gun out, and let them know that I'm sold and that I'm light. Oh, y'all ain't with me. Y'all ain't with me. I'm not going to shout as long as our marriages are falling apart. I'm not going to shout as long as we are divided and divisive. I'm not going to shout. See, shouting can camouflage stuff. What you shouting about? Now, 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 listen to me now. <laughs> listen to me now. This story about Jesus uh, going fishing, and, and I studied that story, and they got in Peter's boat, and, and then Peter pushes off from the shore, and Jesus preaches the word, and he heals people, and then the Bible says that, 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 that Jesus said, I want you to go out into the deep water. Then I want you to go fishing. Now, the Bible says that they were already cleaning their nets. That means that fishing is over. That means that we, you know, we didn't do too good today. And here's what Jesus said. In order to catch fish, in order to bring a, a haul in, you got to go out into the... Oh, Jesus, help me for a minute. Help me for a minute. Yeah, yeah but Lord, we done already did that. We done tried that. You know, we... We've been fishing, and, you know, we did this, and we did that, and we didn't catch nothing. And, you know, we know more about fishing than you do. You're a carpenter. We're fish. But nevertheless, you do funny stuff now. There were folk I thought you wouldn't heal, but you healed. There were folk who I thought demons you wouldn't come and you, but you did. You cast them out. There were folk who were blind, and I didn't think you'd give them sight. But you did it, so I'm going to be cautious here. That's your word. I'm going to go out into the deep. See, one of the reasons we're not bringing hauls in and catches in and fish in. Come on, somebody help me. Because we ain't going out into the deep. <laughs> when we leave church, we're going home. Yeah, and our home's in the suburbs. Yeah, 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 yeah. When we leave work, we go to work and we come home and we go to a nice Publix and hope that nobody robs us and hope that nobody sticks us up. And we don't shop where we got to look over our shoulder. So we think we say. And you know when our church is going to bring in a haul of fish is when Solomon Porch goes out into the deep water. Hey, Rodney, you feeling me? Yeah, I know you feeling me. If ain't nobody else feeling me, you got to take your nets and go out into the deep water. And then 
watch this now. The Bible said that when the, hey, the boat started, wait a minute, wait, what's going on here? And the Bible said they had to call their partners. And said, we got so many fish, y'all need to come and help us. Where did these fish come from? Deep water. Oh, you better hold on to it. Watch out now, watch out now. They had so many fish to catch. They didn't argue about what fish was in whose boat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, when you're doing the will of God and the work of God in deep waters, he will bring you a return. Where you, no, y'all ain't with me. Well, you got to, Peter got to rob Paul, and Paul got to rob Peter, and when you're doing the will of God, you ain't got to worry about who's over at Patmos and, 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 and how many at Patmos coming over here. Your boat is going to be so full until you're going to ask somebody, give me some help. Because our church is running over, you'll tell people at the door, hey, you need to go down to the church at Bethel down the street. There's an Adventist church there. You need to go over to the Hispanic church. They got a little room over there. We ain't got no more room because we've been fishing in deep water. And you would think that they would shout after the miracle, Lavelle, of all these fish. His response wasn't a shout. Peter's response was he fell down before Jesus and he said, I, my bad, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for doubting. I'm sorry for questioning you. I'm sorry for trying to tell you what to do in terms of going out in the deep water. I told you that we know how to fish. And we've been fishing all night and ain't caught nothing. I'm sorry I'm unclean. And then the Bible said, when they brought the fish in, saints of the living God, Jesus said, follow me. Now, if you had so much fish that you couldn't bring it in, I know you had so much fish that you couldn't take it with you. So in other words, what they did with the fish was they, they left it to other people. A lot of us trying to get all we can and can all we get. But they pulled the fish in, and they gave it to somebody else. My question is, what are we shouting about? There are too many people dying. There are too many people hurting. What do we do now with Greg Whitbeck, who was the only son of Sister Whitbeck? If you light and you salt, here's what you do. You go and find his nephew who had confidence in his only uncle. And you say, I cannot replace him. Oh, you hear me. I cannot replace him. But what I can do is, is I can call you and I can pick you up and I can take you to breakfast and I'm there when you need me. I can pray with you and pray over you. I can be a covering for you. Hey, 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 your uncle is gone. If I'm salt and if I'm light, that's what I do. What I do to Mama Whitbeck. I make sure that when all of the noise is over, and I make sure that when all of the funeral arrangements are over, when her son has been laid to rest, that we find ourselves at her house, and as much as she can stand us until she tells us to go away, we're going to be there and say, hey, I'm salt. Hey, I'm light. If you salt and if you light, Hold on, Rogers, we're coming up in a minute. If you saw it and if you light, everybody's child in here who is not in here. Oh, you know why? Because you don't know if the person pulling the trigger might be your son. You know why? Because no, my son would never do that. No, not my son. Let me tell you something with parents who have children who are troubled now, who grew up in the church, who are giving us hell 
They're the same little old boogers that you thought wouldn't do nothing when they were in Sabbath school and vacation Bible school. But them jokers right now, you don't know if they'll shoot anybody or not. In fact, you don't know if they'll shoot you. Can I get a witness with some parents in here who got some children that need some prayer and need to be worked on and worked over? Oh, you thought your little one wouldn't do nothing. No, no, he went to church school. <laughs> no, I ain't got time to shout. I ain't going to shout until my son is in the church. My son is back. I ain't going to shout until my relatives who know what I stand for and get comfortable know that I'm not going to shout. I'm saying we're doing too much shouting. Let me say this before I close. We think that angels are up in heaven on white clouds playing harps. You know what angels are doing? They over in Pine Hill trying to keep the next person from getting shot. And angels need human cooperation in order to work with us so we can work with them. No, y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Let me repeat it. You think that angels are in heaven somewhere on white clouds shouting and playing harps. No, no. They're in your home. When, when, when you're trying to get it together, they're in your home. When your marriage is falling apart, they're in your home. And all they need is a little bit of cooperation. Let me tell you when angels shout. Go look at John 15. Roger, you can help me now. Go look at John 15. And look at the parable about the lost son and the lost coin and the lost sheep. Let me tell you when angels shout. When one sinner, when one sinner comes to repentance, that's when the Bible said that angels have a party. They don't have a party just because we in church having a party. They have a party when souls are one. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 14 that are they not ministering spirits? That's what they do. I'm saying that the shouting gonna come. But well, what do I have to shout about? If I'm salt, if I'm light, does my responsibility go beyond Solomon's porch? Do I call that young lady and say, look here, Solomon's porch is gonna put together a scholarship for your children? Do we call her parents rather and say, look, we don't even know her. But someday, your children, her children are going to say, where is mommy? What happened to mama? And if you salt, if you light, see, our responsibility for goes beyond these pews. And I'm saying, I ain't got time to shout. Not as long as we're losing souls. Not as long as our children are not saved. Ain't got nothing to shout about yet. When they come back into this church, and I see them sitting next to you, and next to you, and next to you, and your husband next to you, and next to you, and next to you. When I see that, oh, that's when I'm going to put my dancing shoes on. But until then, we got work to do. I'm challenging the porch today to go out in deep water. Not superficial stuff. No. Deep water. That's what that, that's what that seven acres is about. Deep water. Community service stuff that'll keep veterans who have post-traumatic stress disorders from going to war. And the moment they hear somebody in there, they, they want to pull a gun because they're mine. We got to help them and counsel them and play with them and, and say, hey, hey, hey. With that. How do you go to work? You come out and try to help somebody. The next thing you know, you got a bullet in your back. coming through your heart. I, 
I've only seen him at church a few times. But when I thought about it, I said, Lord, did I, did I do enough to get to know him? Did I try to visit him? Did I call him? Because you never know when somebody's in that's going to need it. Oh, we're going we to shout the walls down. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I, don't, I, I don't know what you're shouting about. And always the suspect, it appears. Anybody hearing me? He's this color. And they splash the face up on the TV screen. Makes it look like all black men are nothing but animals and, and, and uncivilized. I'm saying somebody got to go into the deep water. The place where you used to live. The place you don't go visit much anymore. You know why? Because it's too bad. Too dangerous. You saw. You, you're light. And if you lose that, you're good for nothing but to be cast out and trampled under feet. Let's do God's will. And if we do God's will, this church will be full. If we go into deep water, I'm tired of trying to rebaptize Adventists. I'm tired, I'm tired of trying to reconvert Adventists. I'm tired of trying to pull them out of one pond and put them in another pond. I'm tired of just switching them from one church to another. I'm tired. Hey, hey, let's go into deep waters, deep waters, deep waters. Get some new blood up in here. Get some blood transfusion up in here. Can I get a witness? All we're doing is pulling them out of one pond and put them in another. Pulling them out over here and put them over there. Go in deep water. Roll your sleeves up. There are a number of doors out there that people like the blank spares on their stairs on their faces. Those folk are at the candlelight and they left with the with the with the with the, with the look that that that. Where do we go from here? Ain't about no polices and politicians. It's about you, salt, and light. If we do that, if we do that, we might just take one gun out of some crazy boy's hand. And then he comes up in church and give God glory and say, I don't do that no more because of salt and because of light. Father, our God. Sometimes I think we were shouting about the wrong thing. And there's nothing wrong with church. I love church probably more than anybody in here. I love singing. I love, I love a good time. I love praising the Lord. But God, there has to come a time when we got to get serious about doing your work. What we don't understand is that Jesus was rarely, at least in Scripture, in the temple. Oh, he went every Sabbath, as his custom was, but it ain't written a lot. Every time we find him, he's out there touching somebody. Every time we find him, he's out there healing somebody. Every time we find him, he's out there touching the lepers. Every time we see him in scripture, he's bending down, telling a woman, go and sin no more. Every time we see him, it's somebody trying to touch the hem of his garment. Every time we see him in scripture, he's out there dealing with people to the point that they say this man sits with sinners and he eats with publicans. Ain't a time in scripture when Jesus was shouting. The time that we see an expression on him is when he died and when he looked out over the people and said they are like sheep without a shepherd. The Bible says he cried and had compassion on him. Father and our God, Father and our God, we become a little bit too comfortable here in our walk with God. We don't want to be righteous like Lot, and not make a difference to where souls are saved. We might spare somebody's home if we let our light shine. We might spare somebody's life if we let our light shine. We might be a blessing to somebody and keep them, God, from going to hell and turn them around to heaven if we only become the light that you called us to be. Oh, God, we thank you for what you've done for us. 
Now help us, oh God, to open our mouths and give testimony to where you brought us from. When people hear that, they will say, what must I do to be saved? We give you praise and we give you honor. We thank you, oh God. Send the Holy Ghost. Not to embarrass us, oh God, but to convict us and to inspire us. To open our mouths and tell what the Lord has done for us. We thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all that he's done for us. Thank you for the fact that he said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Thank you for the power of his word. And then, God, we thank you for the salt and putting light within us to glorify your name. Give you praise and give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen.